Not many cars have predicted the future as well as the EB110. From the extensive use of carbon fiber to the four-wheel drive system, the EB110 was one of the most advanced cars of the time. Sadly, the EB110 dream ended up soon. But it was a fun dream. It's amazing to see the love, the passion and the hard work that was put behind this car. So, hello guys and welcome back to another video. And here is the story of the Bugatti EB110. Bugatti was founded by Ettore Bugatti in 1909. Ettore was born on September 1881 in Milano, Italy on a wealthy family. Ettore followed a technical school for try and quite cycles and was there where he started showing his talent. In 1898, with begging from Pinetti Estucchi, a car builder from Milano, he built his first vehicle, the Bugatti Type 1. The Type 1 was a tricycle with four engines, two on each side of the rear axle. In 1909, thanks to financial support from his father, Ettore built the Type 2, which was powered by a 3-liter four-cylinder engine. From 1902 to 1904, he worked with Born de the Dietrich, when he built the Bugatti Type 3, 4 and 5. Also around this time, Ettore started building his first racing car. While working for Born, Ettore met Emil Mathias and together they founded Mathias Hermes. This partnership lasted only two years, since in 1906 they went their separate ways. After working for some time for Deutz, when he designed the Type 9 and built the Type 10, Ettore finally decided to build his own cars in 1909, when he founded Automobilis e Bugatti in the town of Molsheim, which at the time was part of the German Empire. With the beginning of the First World War, Ettore moved back to Milano, when he built a 16-cylinder airplane engine, which was used by some airplanes. After the war, he returned to Molsheim, when he built one of his best cars of all time. In 1924, Ettore built the Type 35, Powered by a 2-liter straight 8 engine, the Type 35 completely destroyed the competition, starting with a 1925 Targa Florio and continuing with a 1926 Grand Prix. The Type 35 was just unstoppable. Through its life, the Type 35 has won over 1000 races, making it one of the best uh, racing cars of all time. In 1927 came the Bugatti Type 41, or the Royale, how the car is commonly known. The Royale was one of the most luxurious cars of the time, and was uh, built for the richest families of Europe. The Royale was 6.4 meters long, and weighted more than 3 tons, and all this was powered by a 12.7 liter straight 8 engine. Originally, Ettore planned to build 25 cars. But due to the economical crisis of the time, he only built seven royals and, only, and sold only three. Ettore used some of the remaining engines to build some rail cars. Like most of the cars of the time, the Type 41 came with different bodies, and one of these bodies, the Royal as their roadster, was designed by Ettore's son Jean. He also designed four of the bodies for the Type 57 the Ventox, the Stelvio the Atlante and the Atlantic. Sadly, Jean died on August 11, 1939, while testing the Type 57 tank body at race car, which had just won the 24 hour of Le Mans. Everything changed with the death of Jean, and things started getting even worse with the beginning of the Second World War. 
After the war, Ettore wanted to create a new factory near Paris, and he also started working on a new car, the Type 73. But everything stopped when Ettore Bugatti died on August 21st, 1947. After a long and slow decline, Bugatti case production in 1952. Roland Bugatti, Ettore's second son, tried to revive the brand with a Type 251 race car, but the car failed to perform to expectation. In 1965, Virgil Exner designed the 1000C, which was a part of the Revive Cars project, but nothing happened after that. Meanwhile, Bugatti continued manufacturing airplane cars, and in 1963 they were acquired by Hispano Suiza. The story of the EB110 begins in the mid-80s, when four men decided to build a new supercar. These men were Jean-Marc Borel, which was a French financial director and the author of some Lamborghini books, Ferruccio Lamborghini, which was trying to return to the supercar business after he left Lamborghini in 1972. The third guy was the Italian engine engineer Paolo Stanzani. Stanzani is one of the great mechanical engineers of all time. He is responsible for some of the best Lambos, like the Yarama, Espada, Uraco, Kuntach, and most importantly, the Miura. And definitely the most important guy was Romano Artioli. Artioli, an Italian businessman from Bolzano, had made a fortune with selling cheap Suzuki's in Italy. He also had a number of different Ferrari dealerships in Italy and Germany including here the largest Ferrari dealer in Italy. The original idea was to create a new brand, but Jean-Marc Borel proposed to revive an old brand. He proposed two names, Bugatti and Isotta Franschini. Bugatti was chosen, since Artioli was a big fan of the brand. Tac, shock, terribile. La Bugatti cessa completamente la produzione delle automobili e quindi di automobili Bugatti non se ne parlerà più, infatti non se ne parlerà più finché ci abbiamo pensato. In quel momento lì, le famose stupidaggini che, che possono venire in mente a un ragazzo, io ho detto, se non ci pensa nessuno, vorrei tanto riportare in vita la Bugatti. E quindi da quel momento mi sono messo a lavorare come un pazzo, perché mi ero reso conto e, e che, che per fare qualsiasi cosa ci volevano i soldi, e quindi mi sono messo a lavorare ventre e terra per poter avere un giorno la possibilità di avere i soldi per poter far rinascere la Bugatti. È successo molto dopo, ma è successo. Borel started to negotiate with the French authorities in order to get the rights to use the name Bugatti. After two years of negotiation, Artioli and Borel finally managed to reach an agreement with Hispano and the French government. Four months later, Bugatti International SA was founded with chairman Jean-Marc Borel. Bugatti International covered two companies, Bugatti S.A.P.A. and the Torre Bugatti S.A.R.C., both controlled by Artioli. Six months later, the capital of the company was increased from 2 million lire to 2.5 billion and by 1988 to 5 billion. The next step was to find a place to build a factory. Artioli really wanted to build a car in France when Bugatti was at home. Io francamente non volevo fermarmi lì, proprio in casa del leone, no, nella bocca del leone. Volevo, volevo fare queste cose in Francia, ma non c'era niente da fare. I modenesi lei non li schioda. E senza questi ragazzi, senza questa gente che sa fare queste cose, non si poteva fare i Bugatti. Per cui ho dovuto, ho torto collo come si dice, ho dovuto per forza accettare di farle lì. E sapevo che sarebbe stato un rischio, però non pensavo mai di questo... Di questa, di questa in 1987, Stanzani managed to find a 75 square meter place in Campo Galliano, located in 45 kilometers northwest Bologna and 80 kilometers northwest Modena. The construction of the factory begins in 1988, but the new Bugatti factory would be something very special. Artioli hired Giampaolo Benedini to design the factory and he wanted something very unique, not just a factory like all the others. Also, in 1988 begins the development of the new car. Artioli had only one request, 
the car should be a proper Bugatti. Dovevamo partire dal principio che è come se Bugatti avesse continuato a vivere e avesse continuato a fare l'evoluzione delle sue macchine. Per cui a che punto sarebbe arrivato un Bugatti con la sua inventiva, con la sua capacità di fare delle cose straordinarie rispetto agli altri? Deve essere sicuramente di una bella distanza avanti a tutti. And in respect of Fettore, the next car would be named EB1110 and would be introduced in 1991 for Fettore's 110th. So with this in mind, Paolo Stanzani started working on the new engine. He started developing a compact 3.5 liter V12, built with titanium and composite materials. The engine had 5 wife per cylinder and was packed with 4 turbos. At the same time, Stazzani was also developing the new chassis, which was a tubular aluminum one. The chassis was developed in collaboration with Aerospatiale, and this is worth mentioning. Artioli wanted to build the best supercar in the world, so he worked with some of the best companies out there. Aerospatiale for the chassis, Michelin for the tires, and Elf for the lubricants. On March 16, 1989, the engine came to life and screamed for the first time. The EB110 is one of the most beautiful cars of all time and has a timeless design. Even today, 25 years later, the EB110 looks fresh, and the car hasn't aged a bit. But in order to do this, Artioli hired the best designers of the time. Paolo Martin was one of the designers that was hired. Martin had started working for Michelotti in 1960, when he designed the Triumph Spitfire. In 1968 he started working for Betone, and one year later he started working for Pininfarina. At Pininfarina, he designed some really beautiful cars, like the Alfa Romeo 33 Roadster, the Ferrari Sigma Grand Prix, the Ferrari Modulo, and the Lancia Monte Carlo. Later on, he became the director of Ghia. His EB110 was a very radical design. The 110PM had a sliding cockpit and the giant rear wing, but Artioli didn't like the design. Giorgetto Giugiaro was also hired. Giugiaro is definitely one of the greatest designers of all time. He started working for Bertone in 1960, when he designed the 105 and 115 Alfa Romeos, ASA 1000 GT, the Aston Martin DB4 GT Bertone, the legendary Iso Grifo, the Maserati 5000 GT, and some other cars. Later on, he started working for Kia, when Giugiaro decided the Fiat Dino Coupé and the beautiful, beautiful Di Tommaso Mangusta, the Maserati Ghibli, etc. In 1968, Giugiaro founded his own design house, the Ital Design Giugiaro. Ital Design is responsible for some of the most beautiful cars of all time. He designed concept cars like the Bizzarini Manta, Maserati Boomerang, Lamborghini Cala, Volkswagen W12, Ford Mustang, and many, many more. But he also designed many production cars, like the Alfa Romeo Alfeda GT, Alfa Romeo Brera, BMW M1, DeLorean, Fiat Panda, Uno, Punto, Lancia Delta, Tema, Lotus Esprit, Sub 9000, Golf MK1, Scirocco, etc. The Bugatti Ojajuro was the ED90. The ED90 was a beautiful car and quite futuristic, in typical Giugiaro fashion, but Artioli didn't like the design, since the car didn't present a modern Bugatti. The Bertone design was quite interesting for the time. The car was designed by head designer of the time, Marc Deschamps, but again Artioli didn't like the design. Apparently Bertone used the same design for the Lotus Emotion. Giugiaro did a similar thing, since BMW Nazca was very similar with the ED90. And of course, Marcello Gadini was hired. Gadini is probably the greatest car designer of all time, at least for supercars. Gadini originally applied to work for Bertone in 1963, but Giugiaro, which back then was the head designer, 
turned him down. He started working for Betone only after two years, when, Be when Giugiaro had left. There he would design such cars as the Lancia Stratos and Stratos Zero, the second and fourth gen Maserati Quattro Porte, the Renault 5 Turbo, the Lamborghini Yarama, Espada, Uraco, Miura, Countach and some Lamborghini concepts like Bravo and Marzal. He also designed the original Diablo prototype, which later became the Chizetta V16. Some other cars are the Fiat X19, Citroën BX and my favorite Alfa Romeo of all time, the Montreal. But his EB110 wasn't the best and looked a little bit uh, dated for the time. But his design won. By late 1989, a wooden model of Nadini design was built by DM, DMD80, a small company located in Vienna, which was founded by a group of ex Bertone employees. Later, this model was shipped to Golden Cars in Caramango, when the aluminum panels were done. On October 30, 1989, the first aerodynamic test was done at the Pinit Farinas wind tunnel. By early 1990, the first prototype has started being built. Carbon Fiber Industries delivered seven aluminum chassis, and five of them and five were bodied by Golden Car. A1 in silver, the A2 in dark blue, the A3 in metallic middle blue, the A4 in Bugatti blue, and the A5 metallic royal blue. More uh, tests were done at the Pini Farinas with Tunnel with the A1 prototype, and on August 23, 1990, the car was returned in Capo Galliano, where the first run was done around the track of the factory. Some days later, another test run was done in France at the Michelin Ladeau's track. Around this time, one of the biggest changes happened. After some disagreements with Romano Artioli, Paolo Stanzani left the project. Artioli brought another Italian legend, Nicola Materazzi. Materazzi is the father of some of the best supercars of all time. Originally, he started working for Lancia, when he worked on the development of the Stratos. After working for some years with different F2 and F1 cars, he became head of the technical de department of the racing division of Ferrari, when he developed some of the best Ferraris of all time, such as the 28 GTO and 28 GTO Evoluzione, Testarossa and the F40. He definitely left a mark on the Ferrari history, since he was the guy that proposed the idea for, use of, for the use of the turbos. Together with Materazzi came Pavel Raimis, an ex-Audi engineer, who had worked with the development of the Quattro system. On September 15, 1990, for the 109th birthday of Vettore, the new Bugatti factory was inaugurated. A big event was held, when 77 classic Bugattis traveled from Molchain to Capocaliano. Among these classic beauties, a Type 57 carried a flame as a symbolic link between the past and the future. The new factory was just beautiful, like nothing else before. The factory had a large production room, a restaurant, several engine test rooms, an administrative building, a test track and a small building to house customers that would take delivery of their car directly at the factory. Artioli announced that the new car would be ready exactly after one year, for the 110th birthday, and would come with a only new carbon fiber chassis. Development continued through the 1990 and early 1991. Different tests were done in different race tracks all over Europe. One of the problems that the test drivers had these prototypes was the power distribution. Originally it was 40 to the front and 60 to the rear, but Materazzi and Vitekok figured out that 28% to 72% would be a better configuration. In the end it was 27 to the front and 73 to the rear. Meanwhile, homologation procedures were launched and a new chassis number in identification was applied to the prototypes. And the A2 prototype became the first Bugatti of the modern era. While the development was going on, there was still a big problem. Artioli didn't like the design of the car. He said that the car looked like a Lamborghini. Gadini didn't like this 
and so he decided to leave the project. È stato veramente eravamo sotto pressione perché poi ci siamo trovati siamo trovati improvvisamente che l'ingegnere dell'epoca invece di fare una Bugatti eh, tendeva a fare un'automobile che ricordasse il suo tipo di attività. Lui aveva lavorato alla, alla eh, Lamborghini, poi mi presenta questa macchina come per dire guarda che bella. No, questa macchina qui non è una Bugatti, per cui la cancelli immediatamente. Come? Che, no, questa qui non è una Bugatti, per cui via, non voglio più vederla. E... Giampaolo Benedini, the architect of the factory, took over the design. A smoother and a more modern line is used, and the pop-up headlights were removed. Also, the new design featured the iconic Bugatti grill, something that Artioli had wanted from the beginning. Several Cray models were built and tested at the Pininfarina's wind tunnels. Some of these prototypes had rear arc covers, something that was inspired by the old Bugattis. But even though these pieces look removable, they never made it to production. After a lot of hard work, the car was finally ready for Ettore Bugatti's 110th birthday. On September 24, 1991, one day before the launch, a special event was held at Center Internationale dell'Automobile, when special guests could see two of the Gandini prototypes. The new car was unveiled at La Defense Square, under the Grand Arc, where several classic Bugattis were forming a horse in front of the Arc, and the EB110 was standing in the center, uh, under a blue sheet. After Artioli's speech in front of 5,000 guests, Artioli's wife and French actor Alain Delon lifted the veil and finally revealed the new car. Later, Vita Koch and Delon drove the car from the La Defense Square to the Place de la Concorde, escorted by the A2 and the A4 prototypes. If this wasn't enough, a special dinner was organized where 1800 guests were invited. During the night, the cars were sent to Malchain for a public exhibition. The Bugatti was back. I'd like to have been at the lunch when they were deciding what sort of engine to put in the new Bugatti. They decided to make it a V12 and then, after a few bottles of wine, reckoned it would be a good idea to give it five valves per cylinder, 60 in total. Then, a few more vats of wine went down and they reckoned on four camshafts. And then, as the pièce de résistance, they said, let's turbocharge it. Not with one turbo, or two, or even three. No. This has four turbochargers. <laughs> Italians. 
Don't you just love them? The Pompo's presentation was a hit, and everyone loved the new car. Even though the car looked pretty good at this stage, Artioli still wasn't happy. He contacted American designer Tom Tiarda to make some designs for the EB110. Tiarda is the designer of uh, the Fiat 124, Ferrari 365 GT California, the Tommaso Pantera and many more. But Artioli again wasn't happy. So he decided to go with Benedini's design. The prototype of the EB110, named C6, became the press car, and many journalists tested the car. Critics were very positive, and the first customers started coming. In order to make the car ready for homologation, Bugatti built 10 cars, named C7 to C16. Even though the C6 looked basically the same as the production EB110, they were a lot of details that separated the cars from each other. And basically, all the prototypes were milestones that led to the final road car. From the side mirrors to the rear diffusers and the electronic rear wing, a lot of things were changed. On January 1992, the C7 and the C12 prototypes were sent in Sweden for more testing. While the EB110 GT was still under development, Bugatti started working on another version, a lighter and more powerful version, which became the Supersport, or SS. The work started on converting one of the GT prototypes, the C9, into a SS. The body received some changes, like a rounder nose, something that later on was also applied for the GT, a new spoiler and the rear side windows were replaced by a flat plate with 9 holes, a design choice that would become the symbol of the EB110. The interior also received some changes. The wood panel was replaced by carbon fiber, and the seats were replaced by bucket seats, something that gave the car a more sporty look. The Super Sport was unveiled on March 15, 1992, at the Geneva Motor Show. Bugatti announced that the EB110 SS weighed 1480 kilos, 200 kilos lighter than the GT, and the engine produced 600 horsepower, when the GT produced 550. On May 24th, Bugatti set their first record. Three prototypes, the A5, C7 and C8 were set at the Nardo Ring. The C7 was used for the runs, and was driven by Vitecoq. The AB110 set some amazing results. Acceleration time 3.4 seconds, 400 meter run 11.4 seconds, 1000 meter run 20.7 seconds, and reach a top speed of 342 km per hour. And so, the EB110 became the fastest car in the world. On September 16, 1992, the EB110 was finally homologated for road use after the crash tests were done. On December 1, 1992, the first EB110 chassis number GT39018 was delivered to its owner, a Swiss car collector, Franz Wasmer, who still owns the car even today. At the 1993 Geneva Auto Show, Bugatti presented another car, the EB110. 12, a four-door coupé, the first of its kind. The EB110 was powered by a 6-liter V12 with 460 horsepower. Like the EB110, the EB12 was way ahead of its time. The car was planned to enter production in 1996, but never made it. But I'm going to talk more about the EB112 on the next video. Bugatti engineers continued developing the Supersport in order to make it ready for homologation. 
Besides 39, Bugatti developed three more SS prototypes. Chassis number SS 39004, 005 and 006. Bugatti had to start from 004, since the royal family of Brunei had ordered the first three numbers. On May 1993, two super sports, the C9 and the 004, were sent at Nardo Ring, in order to set another record. Vitekok was again behind the wheel. Acceleration time was at 3.2 seconds. 400 meter run in 10.9 seconds. 1000 meter run in 19.6 seconds and the top speed was at 351 km per hour. On August 27, 1993, Artioli acquired Lotus from GM for 30 million pounds. This was a very big step for Artioli, and a move that really changed the history of Lotus and Bugatti. By late 1993, the distribution network was set up. Aston Martin dealer of Paris for France, the Garage de la Athene for and Karugi for Switzerland, Auto Koenig for Germany, Auto Speak for Italy, HRR Owen for UK, and the famous Nicol Racing for Japan. Meanwhile, the first SS order started arriving, and a lot of work was done to homologate the car for the American market. On March 1994, Bugatti had again a stand at the Geneva Auto Show. But this time they were showing the range of colors. Ten different colors were available. Blue Bugatti, Blue Scuro, Monaco Bianco, Giallo Bugatti, Rosso Scuro, Grigio Scuro, Grigio Metallizzato, Grigio Chiaro, Nero Metallizzato and my favorite Verde Scuro. But if you had enough money you could get a car in any color you wanted, like the royal family of Brunei did. Another car that was presented at the 1994 Geneva Auto Show was a modified EB110. Rain Speed presented a Cyan, which had a more aerodynamic body kit, with a completely new front and a giant rear wing. Also, the car had received a new exhaust system and some interior changes. April 28th would be a big day for Bugatti, since their most known customer came to receive his car. Michael Schumacher ordered a EB110 after testing a F40, XJ220, Diablo 911 Turbo and a EB110 GT with the German magazine Autobeat. This was a big deal for Bugatti, since they couldn't get a better publicity than Schumacher buying their car. During May 1994, the first crash test was done for the American market. On July 15, 1994, Artioli organized one of the largest Bugatti meetings, 115 Bugattis, for five days toured through Italy. 1994 also would see the return of Bugatti to the racing circuit. Michel Homel decided to prepare a EB110 for the 24 hour of Le Mans. The aluminum panels of the Super Sport were replaced by carbon fiber in order to reduce weight. The three drivers were Alain Cudini, an ex-Group C driver, Eric Harley, the winner of the 1993 Le Mans, and the Formula 1 driver Jean-Christophe Baulin. With a lap time of 4 minutes and 16 seconds, the team qualified at a respectable 17th overall and 15th in class. But the race day on the other side was terrible. One hour before the start of the race, the team discovered a massive leak in the fuel tank. With no chance of replacing the tank, a tube, a tube of sealant was highly thrown at the tank to seal the gap. Because the sealant had no time to dry, the car had to run first laps on half tank of fuel, and after a few stops the problem was finally solved. This allowed the car to pick up speed and make up some places. The team was hoping a GT1 podium, which would have been amazing for their return. But that wasn't meant to happen. All turbos started having problems, and the team had to replace them all. And if this wasn't enough, also one of the replacements broke. The team now only wanted to finish the race. But only one hour before the end, and after 230 laps, the car left into the barriers of the Moose Lane Strait after a tire failure. On 
On July 1994, a special Bugatti was sent to Nardo Ring. This EB110 was running on methane gas. On July 3rd, Loris Bicocchi set a new world record, with a maximum top speed of 344.7 km per hour. But on the other side, things weren't going so good back in Capo Galliano. Artioli received most of his money from the Suzuki sales. But during 1993, the price of yen went up, and so did the price of the cars. And so the sales dropped. Suzuki took advantage of this, and, and they took over the distribution network. Bugatti was still unprofitable, so a lot of work was done to make the car ready for the other markets, since the European market wasn't performing that well. At the 1994 Birmingham Motor Show, Bugatti unveiled the first right-hand drive EB110. Later that year, the EB110 America was finally ready. The car was presented for the first time in America during Concorso Italiano, when EB110 won the prize for the people's choice. On early 1995, the car was presented at the Chicago Motor Show. Meanwhile, Artioli was working with some Lotus dealers to set up a distribution network. Some of the proposed cities were Los Angeles, West Palm Beach, Chicago, Detroit, New York City, San Antonio and Philadelphia. But things were getting even worse on Capo Galliano. Artioli was trying to sell Lotus, but offers were too low. On the other side, more than 20 suppliers were asking for the bankruptcy of Bugatti due to payment failure. Meanwhile, the EB110 was still breaking records. The Monaco racing team sent a EB110 in Finland, where Gildo Pastor reached a top speed of 296 km/h on the frozen sea on Ulu. The Monaco racing team prepared another EB110 for the North American WSC GT races, but with no success. Things were getting even worse back in Capo Galliano. By August 1995, the production had stopped. One month later, on September 23rd, Bugatti Automobili SAPA declared bankruptcy, with a debt of over $124 million. The factory closed, and 200 Bugatti employees were laid off. But there was still hope, especially after Atioli sold the Lotus to Proton. But on February 1996, the bankruptcy was definitive. A special entry was created, which was called Bugatti Fallimento, in order to liquidate the company assets. On April 4, 1997, a public auction was organized in Capo Galliano to sell the eb 110s left, the spare parts and the tools. Volkswagen Group bought a Bugatti name for an estimated $50 million. They also bought a special prototype, chassis number 24. The Monaco racing team bought many things. Two of the three EB110 America, the EB112 prototype, some concept cars, some complete cars, some chassis and engines, and also an uh, unfinished EB112. Dower Racing GmbH bought uh, some unfinished cars and prototypes, different parts and the EB110 name and logo. They presented their first EB110 in 1999. Later, they presented the Dower EB110S, which had received different modification, which raised the power to 700 horsepower. Also, the car had received different interior upgrades. Dower stopped production in 2005, when they went bankrupt. And so, this was the story of the EB110. A true amazing story of passion and hard work. Only 139 EB110s were built, making the EB110 an extremely rare car. Even though the EB110 is a very rare car and also a great car, they only now have started getting up in value, since only now you can import them in America. But 4-5 years ago these cars were a bargain, especially for a car of this category. Most of them are still in Europe, and a good portion is Japan. All the Japanese ones are some, some of the most beautiful and rare version of the EB110s. Another quite interesting EB110 is the Brabus EB110, 
The car had received a new, a new blue interior and a new set of exhaust, but nothing crazy. Now it's hard to say why Bugatti failed, because there are 100 reasons for that. Artioli blames the competition. Quello che mi ha sorpreso che improvvisamente c'era un calo delle richieste, ma come mai? Eh, chissà perché qui là sopra tutte tutte cose molto strane e non invece le gli ordini arrivavano, ma venivano venivano messi da parte perché bisognava bisognava che la fabbrica eh saltasse, capisci? Ma è stata organizzata tutto molto bene, è stata organizzata da degli specialisti che sapevano anche chi erano tutti i nostri fornitori. Li prendevano uno per uno e gli facevano il lavaggio del cervello e dicevano se tu dai ancora un pezzo di ricambio alla, alla, alla Bugatti eh, tu non potrai più lavorare con noi. Quindi scegli tu un pezzo al giorno contro mille pezzi che fai per noi e vedi un pochettino. Venivano intimiditi. Questo Roberti all'epoca era una banda che eh, la mafia era una, 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 squadra, no, era una squadra di boy scout, la, la mafia rispetto a loro. Questo qui che aveva, la sera prima aveva fatto tutta la messa a punto delle macchine, prende in mano la macchina, si accorge che, che, che cosa c'è sto volante, <ride> sentiva un gioco stranissimo nel volante, no? per cui dice no, ma noi andiamo a vedere, alza la macchina e trova che la scatola del sterzo allentata, allentata la scatola del sterzo, controlla tutte le macchine, tutte le scatole del sterzo allentate. Allora, lei può immaginare, in Germania, queste andavano in Germania, le, la prima cosa che fanno quando acquistano una macchina che fa 350 km all'ora, vanno sull'autostrada e la devono provare naturalmente. Però immaginare uno che non ha mai guidato questa macchina, che quindi non si rende conto che, che lo sterzo non è a posto. Ecco, quelle erano destinate per fare proprio un macello sull'autostrada. C'è un limite a tutto, no? Io dicevo, siamo pronti alla concorrenza, la più spietata, tutto quello che vuoi, lì ci divertiamo, tu fai quella cosa, io faccio una cosa ancora più bella, ma, ma questo qui veramente non è accettabile. And Materazzi and Stanzani blame Artioli. But you can add the economical crisis of the early 90s, which killed all the supercolors of the 90s. The name probably was another reason. Since Bugatti was a name that, was, that most of the people had forgotten by then. The Lotus purchase was another reason. Some people say the factory since a lot of money was spent to build it, but I can't imagine the EB110 without that factory.